Good morning. You can always tell people are excited when they come in and they're meeting new people and having a good time, and, and so you're, we can tell you're excited about what we're going to experience today. I, too, am excited. My name is Neely Gaston. I'm the executive director of the Charlotte campus here. Uh, for some of you, how many of you is this your first time at Gordon-Conwell? Well, it's a few of you. Uh, just a little brief information about us. We are an adult learning center. Uh, we're one of four campuses of Gordon-Conwell. Our residential campus is in Hamilton, Massachusetts. Uh, that's where our HR and IT and, and all of our uh, accounting folks are. Our president uh, lives there, uh, Dennis Hollinger. Uh, he couldn't be here today. He's very, very busy as he is in transition. We've got a new president coming in on July 1, uh, Scott Sunquist. But this is, as I said, an adult learning center. By that, many students commute here on the weekends. We have classes during the week. Through this room and other rooms like this, we, can, we are connected to students around the world. Uh, we, have, we have over 40 countries uh, of students here in Charlotte. And if you put all of our students together, which it's impossible to do because they're all over the world and they're taking classes at different times, we have about 700 students in our system just here in Charlotte. So we're excited to have you today. But we believe in integrating faith and learning. And art is something that God has given us to truly know more about him and also as a way of enjoying his creation and his great love for us. He made us in his image. And as the image of God is a beauty that all of us who put our trust and faith in Christ one day will have an opportunity to see face to face. But on the other hand, how many of us, when we've seen the birth of a child or a new sunrise or the sun setting or the ocean or a great lake or forest or mountains, whatever things that t touch your heart, God touches us and reminds us of his grace and beauty every time we look around this great creation. So today we're very excited to have a person who has given her life to art a person who has committed her time and resources and has given the talents that God has given her to share with us her, her images as she sees through her creativity what God has done. I had the great opportunity to uh, meet Ms. Bowden uh, not quite a year ago. We began talking and, and we said, why don't we do something like this in Charlotte? And I remember I picked you up at the airport. We came, we met. And we started out with the, the art exhibit of Mary, which is on this floor in the rotunda. I do hope you, if you haven't seen it, uh, take time uh, after the reception or sometime during the day. And we also, on the first floor, as you came up through the stairwell, or if you came up the elevator, you missed it. But uh, we've got the artwork of Mr. Bostick from Savannah. And it's, we've gotten lots of great response on that. Yes, the, the background, he's, he's painted on cardboard. He's an African-American artist from Savannah. And these are his, this is how he sees images from scripture. And so between these two art exhibits, we're so thankful that Sandra has allowed us to exhibit them here. And we've gotten lots of excitement. Our students enjoyed it, our faculty, our staff. And today we're going to hear from this great artist, Sandra Bowden. And Sandra, I just are so pleased you could come today. And, and I also need to give just one more plug. We've got a, we have several residential artists here. And if I named everyone, I'd get everyone in the room to raise your hand because you're all interested in art. But a great friend of the seminary, Leighton Ford, he's a, a former trustee. He's on our board of advisors here. Leighton has some of his work. Uh, it'll be out here in the, in the foyer. So uh, he's, he's a little under the weather, so he won't shake your hand, but he'll smile with his typical beautiful face and blue eyes and, and tell you, but we're glad that he's here today. And also, I want to just mention Melanie Spinks. Melanie is, is one of our graduates, and if you're, when you're walking out, if you look over to your left, you'll see an, an art exhibit with, a, with pictures of faculty, staff, and students, and, and it's, it's a mosaic based on a 
uh, a stained glass window, but it's a modern concept. Melanie created that for us when we dedicated this building in 2016. So, I'm so proud of what you've done. And she and Layton have worked with us, uh, with other members of the staff, to not only bring these exhibits here, but they're kind of like our art people. And I, again, I could name many. I know I see a lot of you here that have worked with us, but I just wanted to give them recognition. So. I'm going to have a prayer, and then I'm going to ask you to come up, Sandra, and it'll be, and Leighton, you want to say something, too? I'm going to, why don't you come pray for us and say what you're going to say? <laughs> I'm going to wait for you for telling a lie. Okay. I'm not under the weather. Oh. My wife's been under the weather. But you still gave me the elbow. Uh, you still okay. get the elbow. <laughs> well, I misinterpreted. <laughs> Good morning to everyone here. We're delighted you've come, whatever brought you here, artists or not. I'm glad my friend Peter Gilchrist is here, our former district attorney. He said, I've lived most of my life with lawyers and criminals. I needed to be among artists today. So I think Ann Bird brought him here this morning. So uh, welcome to each one of you. I'm delighted to have our son Kevin right there in the back too. He can't be here for the whole time. But it's nice to have him in Charlotte and here at the seminary. So uh, welcome to you. I will pray. Um, and I'm going to introduce Sandra, or I'm going to have Dwayne or Jennifer. We got family here. Family, son, daughter, no. son-in-law, right? Brother. Bro oh, sorry, that's right, brother. <laughs> the young, young brother, young brother, and Jennifer. What would you say if you were asked to say one thing about your mother? You can't say one thing. It's the woman I most admire. Her um, passion for art, for God, uh, it's very abnormal. So. The woman you most admire, her yes. passion for arts and for God. That's pretty yeah. good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Son of law, agree? Great, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That'd be better>. <laughs> <laughs> and generosity, great. What would you say about little sister? Well, I would say that Sandra is the most God-inspired person I've ever met. Oh, my. Period. Wow. I've met some think? very godly people, some very inspired people, but Sandra just wipes the slate clean. She is so passionate about God. And when you sit down and talk about the Bible with her, she can speak to you in terms that you can understand. Period. Anybody. She can talk to an uneducated person and an educated person simultaneously. And that is something that's really missing in our culture, especially in the Christian culture, is how do you reach both? Wow. And her art does that too, especially when you start to understand. How did you get your kid brother to say all those things? That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I told you he didn't live with me until, I never lived with him until he moved in with us to go to college. <laughs> Give me one word to describe him then. Oh, Dwayne is fun. Dwayne is fun. I can, I can see that. Well, uh, Sandra, come on up here if you will, and bring with that whatever you want to bring with you today, and welcome. So glad that you are here. Uh, I noticed our, my friend Ed Nippers said you've gone for 40 years with your body of work around the world. So we're glad that it brought you to Gordon Conwell's. Yeah. Today, very, very much so. And this is a copy of this wonderful book, The Art of Sandra Bowden. What tell us about that cover? Well, that's all Hebrew text that's been gilded. And why that on the cover? You, I'm sure you well, did you choose has, it or approve it? I've really realized my work has always dealt with ancient languages and the word. And then there's been, uh, so it includes a lot of Hebrew. I studied Hebrew ancient and modern, and then um, Greek, sometimes Latin. And then this body of work that focuses around uh, the crucifixion, so the word made flesh. And then the last few years, it's all solid gold panels. And I really couldn't figure out until a few weeks ago what that was. In the beginning was the word. The word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. And the title of all the exhibitions with the gold is called Beholding the Glory. Mm. So We're it eager is. to hear about it. Here's <laughs> well, you're not going to hear about it today. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to hear about some of it, we know. 
All right, this is the introduction by James Romain from uh, New York City. It's interesting, as I read this, uh, he said, as doubt turns to despair, with all the deconstructed language, many artists have simply given up, concluding that meaning is a myth and the author is dead. And he goes on to say, if being created in the image of God is the origin of human creativity, what could be more natural than becoming an artist? Great. So how did you become an artist? In the um, beginning. Oh, I had a friend who was an artist, and it just triggered something in me in along the third or fourth grade. How many of you started Plus, doing something in third raised, or fourth grade? I was raised in a family where all the women excused themselves after dinner, went into the parlor, and did handwork. It wasn't considered art, but it was. It was the work of our hands. The work of your hand, work of God's hand, too. Mm -hmm. Van Gogh said Christ was an artist greater than the artist because he created and made people, didn't he? <laughs> uh, what would, what's your hope? Thank you for coming. What is your hope uh, that we will see and hear in our time here together today? Well, my whole presentation today is seeing the scriptures. And I hope when we go away that I'm, I'm taking you through a lot of pieces of art rather quickly and giving you clues on how to read it. Art is a language, and you need to know the language to begin to interpret it in some ways. Now today, you know, when you take on anything, it's um, ana uh, synthesis, analysis, and resynthesis. Today, we're a combination of those first two. We're not going to have time to really enjoy some of these pieces, but I'm hoping that all of you will go away with when the scriptures are read about the Annunciation through the birth of Christ, is what we're handling today, you will see some of these images go before you and will help inform and enliven the text. This is important for, I think, extremely important for seminaries and extremely important for anyone who's teaching children or adults. These images should be floating in and out of every lecture that's in a seminary. Amen. <laughs> And in an image-driven world, we need in seminary to learn that, images. don't we? Because yeah. so often there's been this gap between artists and the church. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're committed to here and in Charlotte, we want to see that happen more and more. So you've come to help us in that today. I think I think you're going to speak, have a little break, and then second part. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, unless we all feel we can make it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're through, Melanie is going to uh, respond. Oh, okay. okay. All right. May we pray together. Let's take a moment to be quiet in the Lord's presence, be still, and know that he, the great creator, is here, and we are in his presence. And Lord, we pray that you will speak through your artist, Sandra. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive what you say to us today. We pray in your strong name. Amen. Amen. Can we give a good Charlotte welcome? Just say hello, Sandra. Well, I'm so glad to be here. And um, it was about a year ago that I met um, Nicole um, Martin, who was at um, uh, Gordon College fundraising weekend down at near Hilton Head. And I just handed her my book on my artwork, and she came back the next morning. She said, Sandra, we have to get you up to Charlotte. So here a year later, I'm here. Nicole has moved on to Baltimore. I think she still teaches here. But um, the faculty and everybody picked up, and um, this was not just the idea of one person. This is birth through the whole seminary to have exhibitions here to, to launch that uh, program. And that's, I'm, I may be an artist, but I'm also a passionate collector of religious art, earliest works, maybe early 1400s through to the, some of the most contemporary. And um, I do that because I really believe it's important we, number one, it's a good time to be a collector of religious art. Other people don't want it, so the prices are really good. <laughs> and I have lots of stories I could tell you about that. Uh, but um, 
some of the work is being tossed away and discarded. I learned that from with Museum of Biblical Art in New York City. Major museums didn't even know they had a piece on Mary Magdalene uh, that was tucked in the lowest archive. And um, religious art is not the most sought after thing today. Somebody needs to preserving this and also bring it to life again. And I'm hoping that I can do that. Um, or on the, can we dim the lights here so you can see this better? When, when it becomes images, I have to see. <laughs> um, but, uh, so today I'm talking about seeing scripture, the word made flesh, or the word became flesh. And I'm really focusing on the whole birth narrative. Um, it, um, it was mentioned that we live in an image-saturated world, and we do. We live in an age of an icon. And my question is, how can we, at this particular time, how can the church ignore the image when the whole world is um, saturated with the image? You know, when Martin Luther wrote, uh, translated the Bible into German, there were only 10% of the people that could read. Uh, today, they're telling us that we're living in a post-literate age because so much of what we take in is the, uh, on our phone, the video, movies, television, et cetera, et cetera. So the church needs to arise to this occasion and uh, begin to understand the image, uh, embrace it again. We're gonna look at this passage. In the beginning was the word, or the logos. The word of the logos became flesh and dwelled, um, uh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Um, the Bible is, the word is both written and spoken, but John t takes us even more that it is Christ. Here is an image done by Kent Twitchell, who is um, a, um, oh, what do you call him, big mural painter in Los Angeles. This is on the side of a building at Biola University. This is called The Word. So it's combined both the Bible, which he holds, and Christ the Word. It's a very strong image. Um, I want to say here that the Greeks believed that the other worlds were more important than our own physical world in lots of ways. And I have a statement that tells us that, uh, you know, we have a platonic relationship with somebody. It's not a physical relationship. It's, it's on another level. So um, they, they uh, um, tolerated the body and um, the material, or our uh, physical world. But uh, when God became human in the form of Jesus, born the, the incarnation, that was an anathema or a total disconnect in terms of um, Greek philosophy. Um, Christianity introduced a, dy a dynamic paradigm change. Christ took on physical form. Our God entered the material world and put on mortality. He put on a body. <laughs> I, I want to take you to emphasize that to a church at Trafalgar Square in London. On the portico of that church is a sculpture, a four-sided block. And you're going to see it on the first side. It's in the beginning. It's hard to read because there was no light. Was the word, the word became flesh and lived among us. And then you're going to see the top.
That's the physical reality of the incarnation. Gender specific. <laughs> but isn't that powerful? Uh, yeah, I, I almost missed it because it's quite high. And we came out of a concert, and my husband looked at it, and he said, Sandra, look at this, because it was sort of at my eye level, and I almost missed it. We went back to photograph that. Oops, we want to go on to one. So we're going to begin with the Annunciation. But I think we have to ask, how, how do we understand the Incarnation? What does it mean to be made flesh? And I think we need the artist to help us interpret that even in a deeper way. It's a difficult task for them because they have to look at it, both the physical and the spiritual dimensions of who uh, Christ was. Um, I want us to think about the birth of Christ is all joy at Christmas. This is going to be a theme that runs through our whole presentation. Uh, so Advent is, uh, Christmas is preparing for that joy of Christmas. But yet yeah, Christ came into the world to suffer and to die. And historically, the church understood this, and they understood it in its art. And I hope that you'll see something today that'll help you think about the Christmas cards you get. Do they really say what the church said for so many years? Um, the first piece I have is a little engraving that I rescued off of eBay. It's early uh, mid 1500s. It's an engraving that came, or a woodcut that came out of a German Bible. It's the Annunciation. It has so much. This is packed full. Um, okay, to have an Annunciation, you sort of need an angel. You need Mary, and she's usually kneeling or reading her Bible or something as an artist's way of, of saying that she was devoted. And um, usually there's a lily. Now, the lilies are sort of sick on this one in front of her. <laughs> but they're there. And, uh, and it needs the Holy Spirit. Look up in the upper corner. There's a window that the Holy Spirit has come through. The Holy Spirit is almost, is approaching Mary. Behind her is an infant carrying a cross. What is this? This was done many times in medieval art. Well, our Nicene Creed says, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. This is the church's answer. Uh, partly, uh, here was the baby totally conceived to be implanted into Mary. How is it being implanted into Mary in this picture? It's going right to her ear. The impregnation is through the ear. Why? Medieval mind, it was the word made flesh. Think of that connection. Uh, now, we, don't, we know physically that doesn't happen, but that's a very interesting way to interpret the whole concept of the word. Now, I like this because the window is a circle symbol of God. Christ is there in a baby form in the Holy Spirit, the Trinity present at the Annunciation. Isn't this little tiny woodcut packed? And this was not so strange to those people at the time. Now, in our National Gallery in Washington, D.C., we have another piece similar. Uh, you can see the Holy Spirit above Mary. This is done by, done by Jan van Eyck, 1432. We're not going to say much about it. The Holy Spirit is again coming right down to Mary's ear. So it's again. There's many, many examples of this. So this was, they were struggling to understand it. They don't understand a lot of the um, uh, concepts that we do today about impregnation. But at this moment, God's plan is being set in motion. The law is being transformed into a new era of grace. Then, and, and the angel said to her, do not uh, be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive and uh, um, in your womb and bear a son. And here is one of the most famous um, Annunciation pictures probably in the world. This is by Fra Angelico. Who has seen this at the San Marco Monastery in Florence? 
Some of you? Yeah. This, this uh, Frangelico painted a painting at the foot of every bed in the monastery. This is at the foot of one of the beds. So every monk would have a piece to meditate. Here's Mary and the angel. We don't have some of the other elements. This is just a simple interpretation. Mary is um, in a very humble position. You'll see that position later in many others. And in this one, um, all the elements that we want for the Annunciation are there, um, except the lily. I don't see the lily. The, you have Mary. You have the angel. Mary has the book on her lap. She's reading. Now, of course, they didn't have books then. But these are the people at this time uh, translating into their own period so that they could understand it. And then the, a piece that's in the show here, this is Rudolf Bostick's interpretation. Rudolf Bostick is this black American artist that lives in Savannah. He's a very simple man, but he, um, we call him a visionary artist. He has these visions and he just paints them. And this is how he sees it. This is house paint on cardboard, painted on his bed. Now, the Holy Spirit will come to you as part of what the, um, uh, uh, the text tells us. And the, uh, the angel says, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the most poignant painting I have ever seen to talk about, the, to address the overshadowing is this painting by Bruce Herman, who is on the faculty at Gordon College. I think in this one, Ma Mary is just plain transported to a, another dimension of reality. She has cast herself on the floor. Um, somehow, um, it's, the, it's the reality of the Shekinah glory, which is totally behind her. And um, she has been invaded by the Holy Spirit. And I think that Bruce is saying, we have an invitation to be as invaded as Mary. But, you know, how can we... Uh, uh, what point in our life have we been invaded where the Holy Spirit um, informed us what our role and message would be? And in contrast to that, here's Rudolf Bostick's again. Rather than being overwhelmed and, you know, Mary's frightened, what does he do? He has the angel reach out to touch her head. Tender. Totally different insight. But one of the most famous of all annunciations is this one by Simone Martini in, the, Nash, in um, the Uffizi in Florence. Here the angel is down. He's speaking to Mary. And um, he says, hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And he's directing it right to her. This is a profound and deep moment when um, it's all happening. And it's right to her, it's still to her head that I find interesting. We're gonna see some different interpretations of that. But um, here they are elegant, the angel is beautiful. Mary doesn't answer back in the text. You can see the text from the angel between Mary and um, the angel. She doesn't answer in this, but her body answers. Her body answers for us, her. Here it is closer up. This is another one by Tanner, um, who is an African-American artist from um, Philadelphia. And in the late eight, nine, 1890s, he painted this after a trip to Israel. He has tried to look what is the most uh, uh, how can I ad address Mary in a garb that would be as close as, to sh as she would be in the time of Jesus? And he has found this very humble, uh, heavily woven dress that she's wearing. There's no angel, but what is there? Light. The, the, and she is covered with God's presence in the form of light. 
This is his Shekinah glory uh, present with her. On the um, shelf up in the corner, there's a little candle. You see the artist embed all sorts of symbols in there. That candle is to tell us that Jesus is the light of the world. So when you're looking at art, look for these small things that begin to tell you what is the artist saying. The artist is a visual theologian that's passing this on to us. Uh, the next one. This is one of my favorite. I couldn't wait to take my grandchildren to London to have them see this piece. This is by Filippo Lippi. It's in the National Gallery in London. And I, this is so wonderful. God's hand is at the top. He's reaching down. He shoots out the dove down to Mary's waist. Now, of course, we've got the angels. We've got the lilies, right? You know how to read it now. And he sh the dove is right at Mary's waist. And the dove shoots out a ray of light, and what does he do? He cuts a hole in her garment at her womb. Think about that. You know, one had the ear. But here, he is, to, you know, theologians of his time would never have dared ask the question, how, how, how? But artists deal in a physical world. They have to show something. So here, Filippo Lippi uh, it flies underneath the radar screen, and he is able to imagine whoosh, the impregnation of Mary into her womb. Now, the scripture doesn't say this. Filippo Lippi knows that. And he knows that's not necessarily what happens, but he's, he's telling a lie in order to give us the truth. Picasso said art was a lie that tells the truth. So here it is. It's a way to demonstrate of the physical reality of the incarnation. Remember this piece someday. The next piece is by Ted Prescott, who teaches at Messiah College, or did teach. This is a contemporary annunciation. The girl is, he lived in Mennonite territory. This is a young Mennonite girl. She is standing at a table. She has just baked two loaves of bread. Uh, hanging on the wall is the lily we need. <laughs> <laughs> And um, the angel is a neon light. It's clever. It's wonderful. But it's pregnant with meaning. She has her hand on her chest. Who, me? Who, me? What's the bread? It, but it's also in the shape of a book, the word. See how pregnant with meaning it is? And the bread is on a table. It reminds us of the Eucharist to come. Ted knew all this. He knew his Bible. He knows it inside and out. And he uh, wanted to bring it into our own culture. I think Ted did this probably about 25 years ago. Now, one that's in the show here takes us a little different. We're not now so much with Mary, but this, this Annunciation has the lily, has Mary. She's actually holding a cat in this case. But the title of the work is What If God Had Chosen Kate? This is my friend Duncan Simcoe. His wife could not bear children. And he is asking God, my Lord, what if you had asked Mary, my wife Kate to be Mary? Would I have been able to do what Joseph did? It's a profound question for us. And uh, one I hope you'll meditate on a little bit. Uh, maybe that's a question for all of us in lots of situations. That painting is in the exhibition, and that's one of the reasons I chose it today. I want to end with this one on the Annunciation. You can interpret it now, right? <laughs> We've got all the tools. There is, uh, Mary is so shocked, she drops her Bible, and even the cat is afraid. <laughs> and Mary, uh, the dove, is at her waistline. But I think something you might miss that's really profound in this one. 
The angels, the lower part of his body is all flowers and everything that to do with this world. But as you go up his body, it turns into clouds, cloud formations. So he's, he's uh, uh, representing two different worlds, uh, the spiritual world and the world of uh, the physical world. I regret I didn't buy this piece. <laughs> There's a few pieces that slip by. Now I'm going to go to the visitation. Mary rose and went to the hill country, and she greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Let's look at a few pictures that illuminate this. Remember, you're going to see these when you see the scripture read next time. This is very early 1200s, very simple interpretation. Uh, it's from the Westminster Psalter. And um, they uh, embrace one another. And we know that uh, Elizabeth baby leaped in its, her womb. This is in the exhibition that's out here. This is Albert Dora, 1505, I think. And um, during that time, a lot of these biblical stories, the artist just uses as an excuse also to paint the landscape. So this is set in a German setting. And um, Zachariah is looking out the window, out the door, rather, and uh, Mary and Elizabeth have embraced one another, dressed in, in German garb. And then, during, you know, they speak to one another, and Mary utters the, uh, the Magnificat. Um, and she... Uh, on this one, you know, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then it goes on. And this portion, this is 15, 15th century, so 1400s. This was probably from a prayer book, but it's beautifully preserved. And it um, contains the latter portion of her Magnificat. Another Gordon College pr professor, she's now not there, is Tanya Butler. And she has done this visitation. Now, it's interesting, green dominates this. Why the green? Tanya said it's because it's springtime experienced in old age by Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. It's very German expressionist. The use of color is critical in this uh, particular piece. And next year, at the end of next year, you're going to have our German expressionist show, Was God Dead?, Biblical imagination and German expressionist art. One of the pieces will be this Katie Colvitz. I love this enunciation. Um, they greet one another. They touch each other's womb. There's no landscape around it. There's no um, nothing to distract. You can see it's just their embrace. Now, Katie Colvitz was um, a German expressionist artist. She, um, her husband was the first socialist doctor in Germany. And she sat in the waiting room watching all these people die. And then the First World War was there. She is known for her wonderful, strong woodcuts like this with mothers hovering over their children and hovering over one another. She's given us this hug, uh, hovering and embrace between these two women. I want us to look at the Madonna and child. Um, I want us to just know a little bit about icons. Most of us are not uh, adept at knowing much about it. It's out of our, we're not Russian or Greek Orthodox. Maybe some of you are. You'll, you'll know how to read these. Um, this is called the Madonna of pointing the way. It's a Madonna and child. Look at Mary's hand. Mary's hand is pointing to Jesus. To a Russian Greek Orthodox, they know immediately that Mary is saying, follow him. He is the way. So I hope that will help you uh, enjoy them more. The one on the right is, I think, probably about 1850. And it's very primitive. And you can see, you can't see on the picture, but on the edge, you can see where there were side panels. It was a little triptych. This was probably done in a very rural part of Greece. It was for somebody's home. 
their, their uh, worship center or their prayer center. So it has a primitiveness to it. But still, they are using the same prototype where um, uh, follow Jesus, he is the way. Another popular icon of Mary is called the mother of tenderness. You can see why. Their cheeks are touching one another. Now, the one on the right is all beadwork done by a woman who lives in, um, it's in this exhibition, I think. Uh, so you'll get to see that closer. But I wanted you to see the Madonna and child, historically how it's been uh, even from medieval times. And how I don't, these, these were, the icons are there to help take us to uh, a world of prayer. They're not to be worshipped but to help us enter into deeper state of prayer. This one is in the exhibition, and I thought I'd just show it to you. You know how to interpret that now. Uh, the angels, Michael and Gabriel, are on the side panels. This is Russian. Uh, she's in the United States, but she was trained as a Russian uh, um, um, icon painter. How are we doing for time? I think I better just keep going. The nativity. Are we okay? Yes. Okay, I want to quick start with the nativity. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. This is um, 1255. I want you to look at these pieces, just like you learned the symbols of the Annunciation. This is the nativity. Our Christmas cards are sacred. They have nothing that points to the reason that Jesus came. Historically, the artist always embedded into their pictures something that stated what he came for. What in this picture says to you why he came? The what? The lambs. Yes, that would be one because he was the lamb of God. Uh, it's his swaddling clothes. They look forward to his death and being wrapped to put in the tomb. This is an early icon. Mary is almost always wrapped in blue with red undergarment. Joseph is to the side. He's old. Do any of you know why Joseph was always depicted as old? Well, in Catholic tradition or in the tradition of the church for centuries, it was um, uh, thought that tradition that Joseph was old, his wife had died, and he married Mary later in life, and he came with all the children that would be her, her children. That's how she could have then remained a virgin all her life. So historically, Joseph was always uh, half out of it and an old man. <laughs> You'll see it over and over. Here's another one by Giotto. This is a little later. Giotto was the first artist of the Renaissance. And he, this is no longer uh, um, the Madonna and child. This is Mary and baby Jesus. She's looking right at him. There's an intensity. There's a very personal relationship. Uh, also, maybe some of you don't know, how do you know to read the halo of Jesus? It always has three uh, extensions. That's Jesus. So here it's pretty clear. But she's, she's looking at him, sees his swaddling clothes. It's almost as if she's seeing ahead. Remember, she pondered all these things in her heart. So the artist is looking at that. But there's something here. There's a personal relationship between Jesus and Mary in this one that you don't see in artwork prior to the Renaissance. This looks, you know, come forward a lot of years and think about how important we think a personal relationship with Jesus is. I want to introduce you to um, Joan Bolig as a friend. They're um, small, um, wonderful little etchings. There's almost something cartoonish about them, but there's something very medieval about them, and they are embedded with meaning. In this nativity, what is the clue to his death? Star. A star, okay. There's something else she's embedded here. The carpenter's tool bag. 
that he'll be nailed to the cross. Now, I, I have a whole series of her uh, birth of Christ in every one, even the trip to Egypt. It's on the backpack to go to Egypt. So she's embedded that. So I want to teach you how to look for things and that also the artist knew enough to include them because they're teaching you. This isn't just about enjoying it. It's not just about beauty. It's about teaching theology, teaching the story of the Bible. This is my other friend, Tanya Butler. She te you saw her um, visitation. This is her um, birth of Christ. Now, there's several things in here that speak about who Christ is. Where is the light coming from? It emanates out of his body. The light comes out from Christ. And then there's another source of light, the three candles that the shepherd has. It's interesting, three. Another uh, symbol of the Trinity that's embedded into that. I'm thinking about this being my Christmas card next year. <laughs> because you get my Christmas card and there's always a story on the back. The adoration. This is uh, when the shepherds go to visit Mary and, and, oh boy, they didn't teach me how to go back. I did it. All right, this is a really important, um, this is the adoration of the shepherds. And, well, we had one before, we were missing one. Okay, carpenter bag there again, right? And the, and the shepherds are there, and now we have sheep, another symbol. I want you to look hard at this. This is the most profound um, depiction of the adoration of the shepherds that I know anywhere. This is uh, from Naples, Italy. That's all we know. We don't know the name of the artist. And I want you to look at all the symbols embedded here. Everybody's come. The shepherds have brought their wives. He, they've brought their children. They've all come to the birthplace of Jesus. Joseph is younger here. And uh, the, the woman is looking over. One shepherd has his hands held almost in prayer and worship. A little boy is holding out a bird. Maybe the pigeon for the Presentation, There's, he's got a basket of bread, there's wheat. What else is there? The lamb with his feet tied. What is that? That's the sacrifice of the lamb on the altar, that Christ was to be the, um, the, the lamb of God to be sacrificed. Now, that's a pretty poignant, strong image. And it reminds us of Zubaran's um, Agnes Dei, Lamb of God, that's in the uh, Prado Museum in um, uh, Madrid. Let's go to the presentation. Are you going to see Christmas different next year? <laughs> and she took him uh, uh, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Simeon took him to the sign, blessed the Lord, and said, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, because mine eyes have seen thy salvation. This is the piece that's in the exhibition out here. Mary has handed baby Jesus over to Simeon. Anna is on the extreme right. She, she's been in the temple since seven years after she was married and her husband died. She's now 84. And she's lived there all the time looking forward to this day. And she recognizes this infant that's being brought as the Messiah. Joseph is in the background and two pigeons are held. They were allowed to bring pigeons because they were poor. I gave one very similar to this to my first great-grandson for his baptism. Another of Tanya Butler's, Simeon is holding the baby. This focuses around Simeon holding the baby, and, and he's thinking to himself, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. On the altar is a lamp, which at the end of his um, 
his canticle, he says uh, he, that Christ would be a light to the Gentiles. You can see how she's worked color to help bring about emotion. This is the piece I want you to really not remember. This is um, Rembrandt's Simeon, it's called. This is Simeon, I think, closing his eyes and singing his Nakdimitis. And it's, um, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Rembrandt, this was the very last painting that Rembrandt ever painted. Think of that in terms of what the topic is. It's amazing. Remember this one. Now, to see it, you've got to go to Sweden. <laughs> I have never seen it, so I've got to go to Sweden. But I think this is so powerful that Rembrandt knew he was close to death. Is, and is that Rembrandt in the back of the picture? Huh? Is that Rembrandt's image? We don't know who that is. We don't know who that is. That's a good question, Dwayne. Now the epiphany. This is the wise men's coming. And um, they're going into the house. And I often think it's interesting. They go into the house, not to the stable. I'd love somebody to flesh that out for me. You know, where was this? This is still in Bethlehem, but it's not the stable. They saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opened their treasures. They offered him gifts. Um, this is um, Fabrian, no, who's, this piece is in the, it's a huge piece in the Uffizi Gallery in London, and it is an extravagant depiction of the um, wise men coming with fill, full retinue of everybody they could bring, horses, dogs, everybody comes to the nativity. This is elaborateness. These are kings, and in, in the epiphany, in the uh, wise men coming, historically, the key to understanding these images is the king, fall, the oldest king, falls to his knees, takes off his crown, places it on the ground, and here he is kissing the foot of Jesus. A powerful image of uh, submitting to the one who is going to be the savior of the world and the one who would be the king of kings. Enjoy that image. I think I may have even a closer one. And Jesus reaches out his hand to touch the head of the king. This is a powerful, touching moment where uh, uh, I think it's Jesus, yes, yes. There's another one here that I have that's similar, but I wanted to show you. Um, this is the Adoration of the Kings by Jan Gossert, a Dutch painter. This is in the National Gallery in London. So when you take a trip to London, you've got a little homework to do to go all see all these. All right, in this one, same thing. Everybody's come. They brought everything with them. And the king falls to the ground. He, he, uh, pull, uh, he le takes off his hat. He puts it on the ground. He has handed Jesus the gold in the form of a chalice. You see, uh, they brought three gifts. Gold was uh, for a tribute to the king. Frankincense was a symbol of his divinity. And myrrh was to be used at his burial. But here, the king has handed him this chalice-like, and it's full of coins. Jesus takes out a coin, and he's handing it to the king. It's almost like the bread and the wine. See where this goes? It's really looking forward to um, the Eucharist and the Last Supper. Now, here's a piece that really, there's no question what they're doing. It's right up front. This is the Adoration of the Kings with Cross. This is from 1465. This is in the National Gallery in London, too. Um, and the king falls to the ground. He touches Jesus' feet. 
the other kings gather around with their various gifts. But so interesting to the, to your right, the crucifixion is standing. It's all in the future. There's no question. This is the beginning of his earthly life and the ending of his first life, the Alpha and the Omega. It's here, the whole story. Now, I want to leave you on a little higher note with the epiphany and the wise men. This is Sato Watanabe's work, and I hope someday you'll get an exhibition here of his work. Japanese artist who became a Christian when he was 17, and he dedicated his life to doing <coughs> biblical images with a Japanese um, folk art approach. Now, this is his wise men in a boat. And uh, somebody came to his house or his studio in Tokyo, and he says, uh, Mr. Watanabe, I think you need to read the Bible. Where's the camels? <laughs> and Watanabe says, well, I think you better read the Bible because there's no camels in the Bible. <laughs> he had, you know, he just assumed it. And um, the, the guy says to him, okay, why have you got them in the boat? And Watanabe answered, well, the Bible says they went home another way. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and there is a medieval tradition that they, um, they went by boat. So he wasn't so off, but I just love this piece. So I think you can have a bit of humor in looking at the Bible, too. Now the flight to Egypt is my last section. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Now, embedded in the flight to Egypt is lots of things, too, in the early pieces. Um, this one, I have the date on this for you. I don't have the date. 17th century. This is uh, Bourdon. And um, it's an, an etching. And it's the moment that Joseph is spoken to by the angel. See the angel hovering over Joseph? Comes to him. So he prepares to get the donkey and uh, wakes up Mary and gets the baby. They're ready to go. There's a clue in this piece, though, that something enormous has happened to the world. The clue is the broken piece of column. That's the old pagan world that is now destroyed. Christ has come into the world. Here, it's very poignantly described. See the mechanisms the artist had for telling us this? You know, an old paradigm is gone. We are done with the pagan world. The pagan sculpture has fallen. Christ has come into the world. He's the one who will worship now. And so this shows the beginning of the flight to Egypt. Artists somehow, I mean, I could have shown a dozen of these, the rest on the flight to Egypt. You've all heard that phrase. I think artists really liked it as a way to do landscapes. But even in this one, sometimes uh, there's um, Mary or the baby is usually holding something. And in this, it's a swallow that she has in her hand. A swallow is a symbol of the incarnation. Somehow it was. You know, and we look at all these symbols and you ask, well, how, how do we know? How do we know that that's what it means? Well, Jennifer was with me in uh, Orvieto, and John Skillen, who teaches at Gordon College, was there giving us a tour of Singarelli's chapel. You walk into that chapel, and it's all, it's uh, Dante's heaven and hell. I mean, you're overwhelmed. People are flying through the air, bodies are going, you don't know what's going on. But John said, just, he said, when a person from that period entered this room, they knew what it was. Just like you know, when you flick on a TV, you know whether it's a sitcom, a newsreel, um, a drama, they knew how to read it. These symbols were not obscure to them. Um, you know, the, the second most recognized um, symbol in the world, do you know what it is? The cross is number one. The swoosh. 
is the second most, our culture reads symbols, but our own children, our own adults in the church don't know the symbols of their faith. They don't know the meanings. And that's what I hope to ignite in some of you. <laughs> this looks, you know, the shadows in this tell us that this rest on the flight to Egypt was during the middle of the day. It was hot. And um, this artist, um, William Strang, English artist, he is depicted, and I never, you never thought of it, did you? Did you think of storms that they would have to go through? So here the artists have uh, depicted various scenes, night, day, storms. Now that you've got all the tools you need, you interpret this. <laughs> Tell me about it. Egypt. Yes, that's your first clue. You know this is the flight to Egypt. They're walking along the Nile, right? Notice the fish in the river? You have palm trees. Mary is um, got red and blue on in this case. This is a Coptic icon. This is an icon, a contemporary icon from Egypt. Joseph is older here and they're walking. This was a Christmas card that I had a few years back. But I think the thing we need to remember too, and we've all heard about it on the news, and I don't mean this from any political standpoint, but the truth is the Holy Family were refugees. And they had to, you know, take and make a home. They had to make a home in Bethlehem. Then they had to make a home in Egypt. <laughs> they had to come back and settle in Nazareth. And this is a flight to Egypt by an African artist. We've taken you quickly through. Uh, you've just got a hint, I think, of what I think it's important for us to learn how to read and then, then to thoroughly enjoy them. I wish you could take all these images home and enjoy them after you've seen them, but many of them you can look up. But the one image I don't want you to forget today is the image we saw at the beginning of the sculpture in London. I'm going to show it to you one more time. I think. Oh, we're not going to get it. We're not going to get it, I don't think. Oh, I guess I can't give it to you. They tried this morning to get it. But the last thing I had, I want to, he lives among us. The word that was made flesh, this Christ that we have seen be incarnated, born, lived in our world. He lives among us today, even. Um, that's the end of the presentation, but I have something else I want to, if you're interested in this kind of interpretation, the, um, Ben Quash from the King's College London and the National Gallery and many others are working to put together a visual commentary on scripture. It will include the entire Bible. And if you look under Ben Quash and visual commentary on scripture, you can find the uh, trail that ran introducing it at the Tate Museum. And that's something everybody should be aware of as time goes on. They will have many exhibits of three images that flesh out scripture, just as I have done today. Um, I also wanted to mention the Mary show that's here. There's a couple images I'd like you, now that Mary show was put together because I want the Protestant church to know who Mary is. She was not just the mother of Jesus. She was a follower of Jesus right to his end. And you're gonna see a couple pictures I want you to look at. I want you to look at the one of her going into the temple. You know, she's had three days without Jesus. He's been gone. Wouldn't you be raving mad when you found him? <laughs> In the picture that um, the artist did, she falls to her knees in worship. Very interesting. And another one that I think is really important, 
is Mary was at Pentecost. Most people don't realize it, but the scripture is clear. Mary was present at Pentecost. And in early work, the church always portrayed Mary in the middle of the whole Pentecost scene. All of the apostles are looking up, waiting for the tongues of fire to come down. Mary is sitting praying. Why? The church believed that Mary already had the Holy Spirit. We know that it came to her. She was praying that the others would have an experience as rich and important as hers. Isn't that a fabulous insight that a piece of art gives us? So I hope today what I've done, we, we could turn the lights back on, um, is to ignite an interest in you and a love of the image, that images that are dedicated to um, enlightening the scripture and illuminating it. So I hope this has been helpful. Do we have any questions? I noticed that uh, in most of the paintings, the, the animals were looking directly at Jesus. If they weren't a lamb being sacrificed, the animals were always looking directly at Jesus. Oh, that's interesting. I have to go back and take most of those pictures. pictures. Yeah, interesting. I'll go back and look again. <laughs> yes? Uh, two questions. First, um, where would we find the kinds of Christmas cards that you're talking about? Because I don't want to send out kids anymore. Mm. So, and then, uh, secondly, could you, I, I think one of the things in Protestant Christianity is there's always been a very strong iconoclastic uh, streak within Protestantism that I think has made us very reticent about displays of, of, of Jesus, uh, you know, to the point where some Protestants have argued that any portrait of Jesus is a, quote, graven image, uh, unquote. And so I, I just wanted to ask if you could reflect on, uh, on that as well. Where can you get your pictures? Well, the few places that are left... I can't always recommend this, the Christian um, publishing companies because some of their stuff is really saccharine. Yeah. But you can still go to our National Gallery, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Gallery. You can look for those historic images. It's sad that some of the contemporary images that I showed you are not printed. What I do every year, we, we dedicate five, six, seven hundred dollars a year to put out our Christmas card. Hmm. And I have it designed, I choose the image, I write on the back of the card the story, and I send it out. And it's my gift to every, it's our gift to everyone. And uh, I hear from all over the world, like the Coptic um, uh, flight to Egypt. I had a letter back from somebody in Europe, thank you so much for including the Coptic. Um, and I just look at that as it's not our tithe, but it's part of our witness in the world. And that goes out to all of our friends and all of our um, corporate and um, business associates, too. So um, maybe sometime you gather together with a group or your church publishes something. I don't know the answer to that, but it's a, it's a tragedy. It's not. Now, on iconoclasm. Well, go back and read the second commandment. It's that you shall bow down to. The bowing down to it. Jesus, God did not forbid the creation of images. He said, make nothing above or below or whatever that you shall bow down to. Flip the Bible a few more chapters and it says, you shall make, you know, um, a seraphim with wings on them to put on this. And you shall have pomegranates around the bottom of your garments. He wasn't forbidding anything. It was just how it was to be used. And um, we have to stand up for that. Now, anything that God gives us that's beautiful, it's good, can be perverted. And we can end up worshiping art. Um, we can, and so that's not right either. But there's nothing. I mean, I think some people worship the Bible 
rather than the Christ that it was about. So we could even take the scriptures and worship them as an idol rather than the focus that's on Christ. I know that isn't much of an answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> it's a strong one. Yes. I notice on a lot of, a lot of the images there, uh, I think today's world has uh, oftentimes forgotten about the Holy Spirit. What you see so often is really talking about the Holy Spirit and, and not understandable. But I think uh, artists have, have the ability to bring that bring that back into play. And then also another symbol that, that appears so often when we talk about it is really, and you talked about, even though the Bible wasn't wasn't in those days, the Bible's representative. And so, uh, yes, to, to, to worship the Bible itself, but the words that are in the Bible is what yeah. you put up there yeah. To, yeah. to drive us to, to, to Jesus. Oh, it's, forget all of that. it's the communication he chose yeah, we, for we us. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a website that you elaborate on these different pieces that are part of your collection or pieces that you love? My first question. Our you can go to Bowden Collections, it has to be plural.com, and that has all of our traveling exhibitions. Some of the ex um, <laughs> exhibitions have um, information that would be beside the pieces like what's here. Some don't, others do. Um, the, the next big exhibition that I've just put together is the, uh, this one called Was God Dead? Uh, Biblical Imagination and German Expressionist Art. I think this is one of the most important I'll ever done because this looks at, this only begins to raise the question. So the early 20th century, the intellectuals and the artists were saying God was dead because Nietzsche had said that. You know, we killed him. We have the Enlightenment. We had the Renaissance. We don't need God anymore. Even Nietzsche worried about that. Um, and yet, rumors of the First World War and then the horror of the war came. Where did they turn? They turned to their woodcuts that were in their German Bibles and some, uh, with um, a looking to, feeling also that art was dead. It had gone to be maximum. They also turned to Africa and a deep expressionists. So this raises the question, why did they do it? Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, I have another story I could tell you a little bit about. Uh, our Chagall exhibition is at Ravi Zacharias's gallery, huge, gorgeous gallery as headquarters. Uh, Chagall in the Bible. And uh, that show, by the way, was in Charleston. And one Sunday morning, a Monday morning, I get a call that the church is burned down. 59 pieces are in the church. And they say not one, the, the, the firemen said not one piece, nothing's coming out of this building. 14 hours later, the police, the firemen walk out with 58 of the 59 pieces. Wet. And artists were there, knew what to do took off the frames, the mats, laid them all out to dry. 48 hours later, I'm there with a conservationist, and they have fully restored. And they are in Atlanta now. And they are having a woman that they discovered from Pinehurst. Right? That's, is that North Carolina? Yes. OK. She was Chagall's assistant and worked with him for 11 years. She's 83 years old and is speaking. And they put out the word, and they sold 750 ticker tickets to hear her speak in three weeks. So I'm going to hear that. So I am so excited about what all these shows can do and the conversations. Another story about that show, it was in a church in um, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And they put an ad in the paper, and Jewish people started coming, and then they got a call from the a professor at the university who was Jewish, and he said, I'll volunteer to do a lecture on Chagall. I'm an expert on him for a closing. 150 Jewish people came to the church. And they found a man crunched in a corner crying, a Jewish man, and they said, well, can we help you? What's wrong? And he said, well, this is the first positive experience I've ever had in a church in my life. So art has the possibility of reaching across borders that sometimes words just cannot. What, what is the site that we get the devotional? 
Oh, yeah, you all should know about that. It's called Artway, A-R-T-W-A-Y dot E-U. Sign up for meditations. Every Sunday morning, you will be sent an image of art that has a meditation attached to it. It also has a massive encyclopedic um, writings from all past ones. I've probably written five or six for them. Uh, so you can uh, look, dig into their archives, and you can read. Many of these pieces you'll have seen today will have been written about on that website. That's good. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, Art, A-R-T-W-A-Y dot E-U. And the person who runs it was Rookmacher, is Rookmacher's daughter. And she um, pulls from all over the world people to write and submit images. How many of you knew about that site? A few of you. Well, every Sunday morning you get a visual meditation. Yes? It's at the Ravi Zacharias headquarters in Alpharetta, Texas. Oh, wait a minute. Al Alpharetta, Georgia. <laughs> it goes to Texas the, uh, after that. I think it's there March, April, May. So it's there for a good length of time. You want to check to see when their gallery is open. It's at their headquarters at Ravi Zacharias headquarters. <coughs> they have a fabulous, fabulous big gallery. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you for your interest. And I hope this changes you a little bit. Uh, okay, bye. Yeah. Yes, Sandra, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Gordon Conwell community for your teaching today. I don't know about you, but I can't get enough of this kind of instruction. You know, instruction like this, you see what she's done for us today. Do you appreciate the, uh, the art out in the exhibit that much more? Doesn't, yeah, art, and, and teaching like this is like light. Truth is like light, and by light we can see. All right, and then the more we see, the more we understand. And the more we understand, the more we appreciate. So thank you for bringing light and truth and appreciation today. Uh, I wanted to say I, I, was, I received this. This is my church that burned that morning. This is from a text from our worship leader. And he sent me the church in, uh, from Charleston, yeah, St. Andrews, that was my church. Yeah. And he sent me this text and he, that morning and he said, Melanie, you won't believe what happened. And I was so grieved and that was the first thing out of my mouth, the Chagalls. And it was such a, I can't tell you that was a miracle um, that they were preserved, so For thank you. For a real good purpose. For a real good purpose. <laughs> so on behalf of the Gordon Conwell community, thank you for your work in the world. It's very important work, and please continue. Keep on. So, church, I want to tell you, uh, I've read a couple of strange invitations lately. Rosalind Krauss uh, of Art Forum fame, uh, maybe you know October uh, Art Theory Journal for Art Theory, has, one, has pondered where are the Christians, especially looking at this great history of art, where do the Christians go? Why aren't they contributing uh, to the art theory that's happening today? Another, uh, I was just listening to Camille Paglia. She had written a, she's an art historian, a famous art professor, controversial, up in Philadelphia, and she wrote a book, Glittering Images. And they said, Camille, why did you write? And she said, I wrote this for the evangelical homeschool mom. Hardly an ambassador, hardly a strange invitation from someone who would call herself an atheist, transgender lesbian. But she wants to know, where are the Christians and why aren't they participating in today's world? So it's strange when the world is asking, where are you? Are you ready to answer the call? Here we are. Can this be a community where we can grow in our understanding and our appreciation? We can sh take time to sharpen the ax and answer the call. Yes, here we are. God's glory can shine in the art world again, just as it has in our past. So thank you. All right, God bless. Just another story about the exhibit at Mount Pleasant. Several of us were there working with that church, which we're now in partnership with, with an educational. I saw the art. I didn't want to talk to them about the education. I, I was walking around looking at the art, and it burned the next Monday. 
right after we were there. So, you know, I want to tell you when that um, when the Chagall show first went up at our church in Chatham, Massachusetts, everybody said, "Oh, we've got to get we got to get uh, cameras up here. What about the you know the the risk, the risk, the risk?" They were going crazy. I said, "You know, don't worry too much because if we lose this whole thing, our lives are not going to change." And the real risk is Bob's nephew who is a missionary in Niger with four little kids, and every day they get a message from the American, United States government, should they stay or leave. I said, that's risk. And the morning that I got the call, I didn't, I wasn't filled with fear or anything. I was a little angry over the summer when I had to reframe it all. <laughs> but I was so glad that I had been able to verbalize it before and then apply it, because I think if we don't think things too, things through sometimes we're caught off guard. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to say what spoke to me on the chapel in the first responders. So I minister to those that see Christ constantly. And so what spoke so much to me when you talk about that is those firemen who were so used to destruction and pain say we're not going to find anything. And they come out with those. And so I just think of how God used that to speak life and hope. Mm. Oh. To a group of people that's been nothing but pain day after day and answer that call every day. Yes. So even through that, even in that moment for you, the mind of peace, I just can't imagine what that spoke to them as a group without God saying a word except watch what I can do, even though all you see is destruction. You pull life back, which you never expected. There were a lot in that church that were more concerned about. I felt that they were more concerned about the Chabals than they were about losing their place of worship, but I think it all settled in. <laughs> they, they were. <laughs> okay, before everybody leaves, uh, I want to thank you for coming. We have a full luncheon downstairs immediately below this room. You can take the elevator down or the stairs on, that you came up on. Do stay because we've got a uh, – Michelle Littlejohn has always done a wonderful job. We want you to stay, and hopefully you can visit and maybe get a word in with Sandra. Let's give her another hand for coming in. And uh, I'm going to pray for the food and close this meeting. Again, thank you for coming today. Our Father and our God, we give thanks for the joy we have to know you through Christ and for the joy of seeing you through visual image. What a wonderful message today to remind us that you call us to see you through our hearts. And for each one, we may have a specific image, but we worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, not what we think you look like, but who you are. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for touching us, bringing us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We've been reminded today through art that the light shines through Christ and through him alone. For we offer our prayer. We thank you for the food below us. May it nourish our bodies and give us strength for service. Protect us from evil and from those who would do it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again.